welcome you to today's ECD Star introductory colloquium on the science topics of the workshop Probing Nuclear Physics with Neutron Star Mergers. This workshop was planned for 2020, but has been deferred to 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It will deal with multi-messenger astrophysics in the context of neutron star mergers. The first joint gravitational wave and electromagnetic observations of the merger event GW170817 have substantially shaped our understanding of the heavy element formation via the rapid neutron capture process. process. Important open questions remain in this field that are actively being addressed by researchers around the world and that will be discussed in the upcoming workshop scheduled for the summer of 2021. As you know, the intention of this colloquium series is to introduce and publish the science case of the workshop in question to a wider audience. Today's introductory talk will be given by Matthew Mumpower, currently at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Dr. Mumpower performed his graduate studies in nuclear astrophysics at North Carolina State University under the supervision of Gail McLaughlin. His PhD focused on the formation of rare earth nuclei in the R process and in 2012, he graduated and went to the University of Notre Dame as a joint Institute for Nuclear Astrophysics hostel. There, he performed important sensitivity studies on nuclear properties in the R process that have since motivated many experimental campaigns around the world. In 2015, he took a postdoctoral position at Los Alamos, where he became a staff member in 2017. He's an active mentor of postdocs at the Los Alamos Center of Theoretical Astrophysics and the PI of several research initiatives, including one that studies low energy fission. He's also co-PI for the fission in our process elements or fire in short collaboration. Matthew, thanks for agreeing to give this talk. Well, thank you for uh, this kind invitation. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about our workshop um, entitled Probing Nuclear Physics with Neutron Star Mergers. And just, uh, let's see here. Let's click here, make sure we have it. Okay, we just have a laboratory caveat. Since I'm from Los Alamos, this is being recorded. Just note this caveat. And about our workshop. Well, we're really delighted that this will be uh, held in the summer of 2021. Uh, what is our workshop about? Well, uh, in 2017, there was this first observation of the merging of two neutron stars. They observed gravitational waves and an electromagnetic signature uh, for the first time in such an event. And these broadband observations provided a window into uh, the nucleosynthesis that we think uh, is ongoing in these events. Uh, it's known as the rapid neutron capture process. And this nucleosynthesis is really interesting because it combines together many, many fields. We have nuclear physics, we have atomic physics, we have models and simulations of the astrophysical event. And so it requires a, just a very large community uh, that must come together in order to solve this really uh, deep question that we've been trying to answer for many decades, and that is, what is the origin of the elements? So in this workshop, we're going to bring together people that uh, discuss different aspects of this very difficult problem. We want to talk to people that do neutron uh, capture cross sections. Uh, we're going to bring um, together people that do dense matter physics, neutrino physics, and those that model the ejecta uh, itself in terms of the um, astrophysical simulations, but also what sort of signals can we get out of this type of event. 
And so uh, it's really, really been a blessing that we've had this observation. And so now um, our workshop will just bring together the experts that um, will talk about all of these caveats and very interesting um, aspects of neutron star mergers. And in particular, we'll be focusing on what can we say about the nuclear physics. Um, so here's the organizers of the workshop. We have Chris Fryer, myself, Jonas Lipner from Los Alamos National Laboratory. We have Benoit, Stefan Roswag, Andrew Steiner, Rebecca Sermon from the University of Notre Dame. And the workshop website, as you can see, is, is listed down below here if you're interested in um, learning more. So in this talk, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, nuclear astrophysics, sort of what do we study? How did it sort of come about? Uh, then I'll go into the details of nucleosynthesis. This is really where we, I think, personally is the strongest overlap between nuclear physics and astrophysics. And there's a subset that we're very particular uh, interested in in the merger environment, which is this rapid neutron capture process. So I'm going to give you sort of a, a brief overview of the R process and why this problem is so hard from the aspect of nuclear physics. And then we'll talk a little bit about mergers. And finally, we'll discuss the open questions that uh, the speakers of our workshop will try to address and are currently addressing in their, in their current research endeavors. Okay, so uh, I believe the, the dawn of nuclear astrophysics started with several questions. For instance, how, we've been asking these for quite some time, but really it's only been the past 100 years or so that we've really started to make progress on these questions. So how do stars shine and why do they shine for so long? Um, this was uh, a, a very hot topic of research in the late 1800s. And one of the first ideas that came about was that it was, um, uh, we were converting gravitational energy of the stars into heat. However, what they quickly found was that there's just simply not enough energy uh, in, in the gravitational potential for, for stars to radiate so long. This is you know, only on the time scale of millions of years, but we know stars can last uh, much longer than that. And even if the heat you know, from the sun is radiation dominated, it's still not enough energy here. So one of the great insights I think was uh, both from Edenting and Hans Bethe that they looked at why these stars shine for so long. And it was really uh, in 1938 where um, we finally came upon this idea that nuclear reactions could be releasing the energy that powers stars. So it's this famous Einstein equation equals mc squared where you have a little bit of mass um, and that can create a lot of energy because the constant C is so large and then you square it. So you get some very small amount of mass producing a lot of energy. Uh, this insight, along with um, others during this time period, really laid the foundation for the ideas of nuclear physics, combining nuclear physics with astrophysics. And one of the seminal papers that we often think about really as and marking the start of nuclear astrophysics is this famous Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle in 1958, never mind, 1957. And so that's where many people mark as the, as the start of nuclear astrophysics. So in particular in nuclear astrophysics, when we talk about probing neutron stars with nuclear physics, really where we wanna focus our effort is on nucleosynthesis. So nucleosynthesis, what's the definition? Well, it's where we form new atomic nuclei by nuclear reactions. Um, oftentimes, again, this is in the interior of stars and in the early stages of the universe, right at the very beginning during the Big Bang. But one of the places where the, if you look up this uh, definition in dictionary.com or other places, Wikipedia, they often miss 
that we also look at this in explosive astrophysical events like the merger of neutron stars. And so that's where we'll focus our efforts today and indeed in the workshop are these um, explosive events like uh, the merger of neutron stars. And as Carl Sagan often said, you know, we're all made of star, star stuff. And this is indeed true as, as we'll come to see a little later. So when we talk about the nucleosynthesis um, in, the, in the local universe and in the galaxy and indeed in the solar system, we oftentimes want to know how much stuff there is um, as, a, as a function of how heavy the element is. So in this figure, I show uh, abundance on the y-axis and on the x-axis proton number. And so you can see hydrogen and helium are the most abundant elements. Those are on the far left of the diagram. And then this curve is relatively, besides the odd even staggering, roughly decreasing as we produce heavier and heavier nuclei. And because the sun is you know, the most of the mass in the solar system, most of our information comes from either uh, solar observations or from meteorites. <clears throat> so just to give you an idea, um, iron is at the iron peak, Z uh, 60 or 26, and then we have gold uh, much, much heavier. It's just above platinum. Uh, and that typically has a mass number of around 200. And the important thing about this curve uh, that we observe is that the formation of the elements didn't occur all at the same time, nor at the same place. And so that begs the question uh, in nuclear astrophysics, what is indeed the origin of the elements? <clears throat> so to answer this question actually requires a lot of detective work um, that has been done over the course of many decades. Uh, the first uh, of, of the lightest three elements we know came from the Big Bang. And so um, there are many interesting reactions that go on there. Uh, we create um, roughly uh, this hydrogen and helium is roughly within the, the first three minutes. And it ended, this process ended because the universe cooled and expanded roughly within the first 20 minutes. And so you might think, well, it's pretty straightforward. There's only so many reactions that we can write down. Um, and here's, you know, 12 key reactions. But actually, there's some interesting uh, physics here that still remains uncertain. And so you can Google the, the cosmic uh, lithium problem uh, to learn more here about open questions, even with light element production that people are still exploring. Uh, the next uh, area that we have to um, try to describe on the periodic table of the elements is the, the dip that we saw in the previous figure with the uh, solar system abundances. There was this dip with uh, near boron. And um, this comes from uh, the fact that these elements are often skipped over in other astrophysical environments. And so we think that spallation by cosmic rays might be causing uh, the abundances that we observe in the solar system for these particular nuclei. Uh, when we uh, fuse elements together in stars, um, this, this can happen up to iron. Um, and so this is the, uh, the nuclear fuel for stars. And you can see at different temperatures here, we can produce uh, different products. We can fuse hydrogen into helium that occurs at a given temperature and that lasts for a very long time. However, when we start burning the other elements, uh, helium into carbon, carbon into neon and magnesium, et cetera, you'll notice that the duration there of the uh, element population, uh, uh, the duration of the, of the burning rather is um, uh, decreasing in time. So you have diminishing returns uh, for burning these heavier and heavier elements. And the reason for this is if we look on the left diagram here, you can see the number of the average binding energy as a function of number of nucleon, nucleons in the nucleus. And so you initially get some, a lot of energy release when you're fusing hydrogen into helium. 
and then you get this diminishing returns as we go up to iron. And then uh, the curve decreases as we go to the heaviest species, uh, like towards the actinides that may be around mass number 230 to 240 to 250. Um, so that gives us a reason uh, why um, stars are shining, but also why in stars we don't produce much beyond the iron peak elements. So then the question becomes, well, if I want to get beyond iron, how do I do it? So there's um, many different uh, proposed synthesis processes. Uh, the primary ones are the, the P process, uh, the S process, and the R process. And it's particularly the R process where we're really interested in this overlap uh, in our workshop um, with the uh, compact objects, the neutron star mergers that we'll um, be talking about shortly. And so it's the, it's, the, it's the slow or rapid capture of neutrons from, uh, from medium mass to heavy nuclei that really um, is where these elements are forming. So they're, they're forming by processes, nuclear processes that aren't just capturing charged particle reactions um, because they're Coulomb barriers uh, for these heavier elements as we stuff more and more protons and neutrons into the nucleus are just so large. And then finally, the last of the elements on the, that appear on the periodic table, um, th there's an open question whether or not they can be produced in nature um, or we can produce them potentially uh, in the laboratory. And so you can see this is actually a quite old slide. Now we know uh, that the, the last element here that I list on the periodic table is named agonesin. And so uh, that has 118 uh, protons in the nucleus and, and researchers just recently have been able to produce this nucleus in the laboratory and, and subsequently watched its decay. Okay, so further evidence of this interplay between nuclear physics and astrophysics can be seen if we plot the solar abundances in a slightly different way. So rather than plotting the number of protons on the x-axis, we can actually just count the number of nucleons. And one of the um, great insights of uh, the work that was done in the 1950s is that they were able to construct this abundance curve. And then they noticed that the, there were offsetting peaks. So they, of course, they didn't have it colored at the time, but you can see the red curve is certainly dis, has distinct peaks than this teal colored curve. And so this really told the researchers at that time that there are probably two different processes that are creating heavy elements uh, in nature and in in that happened. Um, in our solar system. And so this was quite an interesting insight. And they wondered, you know, what is actually causing the major peaks to, um, to be created? What was, what was the underlying physics region that, uh, that was causing these, these bumps? And it turns out that this is where they really linked these astrophysics observations with nuclear structure. And they were able to say, ah, it's, it's from the nuclear structure uh, that is piling up this material at more stable nuclei and in different environments that really causes the peaks to form where they do. So that brings us to the slow neutron capture process. Uh, the slow neutron capture process, um, for instance, can happen in AGB stars. And it's where, why is it slow? Why do we call it slow? Well, it's that the fact that these neutron captures, which allows us to produce heavier elements, are slow relative to beta decay. So oftentimes we say that the, the time scale for neutrons is much, much greater than the time scale for beta decay. And so nuclear physicists are interested. They don't just plot the periodic table in terms of rows and columns of the of, of, of elements like the periodic table is plotted, they actually want to know how many neutrons do we stuff in to a given isotope. And so that means we need two dimensions rather than just one dimension 
to describe these nuclei. And so if you look at this figure here, you can see the number of protons is plotted on the y-axis, but the number of neutrons along each isotopic chain here are plotted on the x-axis. And so the, uh, in terms of these uh, nuclear physics um, reactions that we, we know are happening, this will allow us to either move left to right in the diagram and in terms of capturing a neutron, you're gonna add a neutron and move to the right in the diagram, or we can nuclear beta decay, which then takes us sort of diagonal. It converts a, a, a proton into, a neutron into a proton in the nucleus. And so that moves us diagonally. And so you see the zigzag pattern can form uh, that takes us through this chart of nuclides here. And so what's unique about the slow neutron capture process is that we stay near stable uh, nuclei or slightly uh, radioactive species that are relatively long lived. And in, the, in those types of environments, you beta decay relatively quickly and you generally don't capture along an isotopic chain very far um, as indicated up here like this. Generally, those types of neutron captures are um, for very long um, number of neutrons in the chain are found in the R process, as we'll see momentarily. So this brings us to the, to the nuclear physics that will be discussed in the uh, workshop. We really need, when we describe uh, neutron capture, we need information on the nucleus itself. We need to know about the energy levels of the nucleus. We need to know how the nucleus uh, de-excites once it's populated uh, via this neutron. And um, in particular, how it de-excites via gamma rays. There are really interesting physics that's going on with the gamma rays, um, these, the gamma ray energy, um, uh, the gamma ray strength function uh, in terms of how we, how many uh, gamma rays are populated as a function of the gamma ray energies uh, in and of itself is a whole area of research. And then we also need to know um, the nuclear levels themselves, so how dense they are. Um, and if they're sufficiently dense, then we can use uh, theoretical tools like Hauser-Feshbach theory uh, to try to describe this type of nuclear reaction. So that's neutron capture, one slide overview of neutron capture in a nutshell. For nuclear beta decay, it's a little bit different. What we need is uh, we need to be able to use Fermi's golden rule. We again need nuclear levels, but we also need to know um, the, the, uh, the, the binding energies of these nuclei so that we can calculate um, the energy total energy release, which we call Q beta. And so you can see here in this diagram, if a, a parent nucleus decays into some daughter nucleus, we need to be able to predict exactly what levels the nucleus may go to. Those levels then de-excite uh, either via um, gamma emission or via neutron capture. And this can continue, especially for nuclei that are much more neutron rich uh, for some time. So you could beta decay and then potentially on average emit quite a number of neutrons before you land in the various uh, nuclei. Uh, and so one of the machinery, the tools for nuclear physics that we have to describe this um, beta decay strength function uh, is quasi-particle random phase approximation. So there's many people um, that are using these tools. The, one of the new hot topics is this finite amplitude method. Um, which seeks to avoid some of the uh, computational complexities that QRPA presents. Um, so that's, that's sort of my one slide overview of nuclear beta decay, but let's return um, to, to this idea of, of capturing many, many, many neutrons on a very, very fast time scale. And so when that happens, we again have our diagram here, we can, we can push very far right in the diagram if we're capturing many, many neutrons uh, before we again beta decay and move up to the next proton number. 
And so what happens is you end up going very far from the stable isotopes. And uh, when this happens, this is known as the rapid neutron capture process. So this is distinct from the, from the S process, which we know can occur in the interior of stars. So where in the, um, where in the universe can this R process occur is one of these uh, grand open challenges that we have in nuclear astrophysics. So here's an example plot of what, if we take away this, in, the, in the solar system, if we take away all the contributions from other nucleosynthesis processes, we're, leave, we're left with this curve here and which we call the solar isotopic um, residuals. And so why is this um, process so difficult to describe? Well, it's, it's really difficult to describe because there are so many uncertainties. So it's, it's interesting because, again, it's responsible for roughly half the elements above iron and potentially all of the heavy elements that can occur above bismuth. So if we look at bismuth on the periodic table, that's at Z of 83. So anything above um, would have to be produced like something uh, with the R process. So that's really interesting. It means that all of the actinides that we observe in nature, things like uranium, plutonium, thorium, must have been created in the R process. And this means if we're producing these nuclei by lots of neutron captures, followed by subsequent beta decays and neutron captures again, we need environments where there are many, many, many neutrons available, many free neutrons available. That's why indeed neutron stars are so interesting. So um, the difficulty, let's return to it. Uh, why is the R process so difficult to describe from in the, in the context of uh, nuclear physics and astrophysics? On the astrophysics side, it's really computationally difficult to model these environments. It takes um, supercomputers, you know, months on end and potentially years on end if there's a high fidelity simulation to produce and look at the hydrodynamics that um, is responsible uh, from these events, whether they be supernova emerging stars. And on the nuclear physics side, we're really in a bind because we're producing nuclei that we cannot produce in the laboratory. Indeed, the nuclei themselves are very short-lived that pr are produced in the R process. This is in contrast to the S process where you know, it moves along this valley of beta stability. And so nuclei are relatively stable. It's relatively easy to produce them in the laboratory and measure the interesting properties. Conversely, with the R process, almost everything is unknown about these nuclei. We, need, we don't even have how long they exist, their half-lives, most basic quantities. We don't have things like their binding energies. And so this means that in order to understand processes that may be going on in neutron star mergers like the R process, we need a very, very detailed uh, picture of the nuclear physics of these nuclei. And so one of the things that we need to understand are these binding energies. We need to understand their, uh, the nuclei's beta decay rates, their half-lives, how long do they um, go before they, uh, you know, half of the uh, material decays. We need to understand on these short-lived nuclei how do they capture neutrons? Because that's one of the primary reaction channels. And we need to understand that if we stuff so many neutrons into the nucleus and the nucleus becomes unstable, how exactly does it become unstable? Does it uh, emit those neutrons? Do they just drip out of the nucleus? Does, is the nucleus heavy enough to potentially undergo um, an event where it breaks up into two smaller fragments. That's the process known as fission. And you can see all of these intricacies of nuclear physics, whether it be shell structure, the, 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 the nuclear uh, potential, 
whether nuclear deformation, uh, level densities, branching ratios, isomeric states, all of these really interesting nuclear physics uh, properties and descriptions are needed to understand the outcomes. What can we produce in neutron star mergers? And so the other interesting aspect of that is that the R process happens very quickly. So it happens on the time scale of a second. So you're producing almost every species that you could possibly think to exist in the entire chart of the nuclides in roughly one second. This is an incredible process that's occurring in nature. And so the data itself is naturally incomplete. That means that we really have to focus on the nuclear physics. So let's, let's take a look at what sort of data we have from the species uh, that we do know in, uh, in currently in nuclear physics. So again, if I generalize my uh, periodic table and I look at this chart of nuclides, I can plot not only proton number, but also how much neutrons are stuffed into the nucleus. And for half-life measurements, we have quite a substantial amount of data. There's several thousand species where we have some estimate of the half-lives. And the black dots here are the stable nuclei. Now the line tells us what potentially we can do with radioactive beam facilities here. So the R process operates and it neutron captures, beta decays, neutron captures all on this sort of southeast side of the diagram. And so you can see if it's operating over here, we have quite a bit, even with the half-lives, we have quite a bit of missing data that we're going to need to describe the R process. When experimentalists, nuclear experimentalists do other measurements, they can, um, they can extract other nuclear properties, like what is the binding energy of the particular nucleus. And one of the things you'll notice right away is that there's less information of the binding energy than there are the half-lives. That's because these measurements require um, different capabilities. Oftentimes nowadays we think of very precise direct measurements with pinning traps. Um, and so we can find out through, via these measurements and experimental campaigns the very, uh, very exact binding uh, of these species. In the past, studies often looked at um, um, uh, reactions or um, decays to try to estimate the binding energies. But nowadays, we um, can move towards these pinning traps. They're very accurate. But again, we lack many, many data. And potentially, the new facilities will provide us a lot more data so that we can understand really the um, production of the heavy elements in nature. One of the areas where it's you know, uh, very uh, difficult to make measurements is with capture rates. So capture rates, as you can see here, are only known for stable or near stable nuclei. We have, there are no capture rate measurements for very neutron rich nuclei. And so this is one of the areas where radioactive beam facilities like FAIR, EFRA, RICKEN, they all can make really great progress by producing beams that may allow for uh, surrogate techniques like beta Oslo to tell us something about neutron capture rates. Um, there's beta Oslo, there's other surrogate techniques like uh, DP reactions that may be interesting that get, may give insight into the capture rates of these neutron rich species. That'll be really interesting and we're excited to hear about uh, the latest developments here on our workshop. So to varying degrees of accuracy, when we try to understand the synthesis of the elements in the R process, we have some information in the gray region, whether it be a half-life, capture rate, a mass, maybe it's a fission yield, we have some information in the gray region. However, when we uh, look at calculations of the R process, the R process is proceeding through 
this orange region here. And so you can see right away that this is why we need the nuclear physics. This is where the nuclear physics overlaps so strongly with the astrophysics. We're going to need nuclear theory calculations much further out because even in the era of facilities like FRIB, which may produce nuclei out to this line here, we're still going to have uncertainties on exactly maybe where the shell closure, how, how the strength of the shell closure. And we're also going to have uncertainties up here. If the, if the nuclei become heavy enough, they may undergo fission, in which case we again need uh, nuclear theory to help tell us what's going on. But the bottom line here is that these new measurements are going to help us constrain our theoretical models. And so we believe that um, this workshop and, and future experimental efforts um, are really critical in, in helping us be able to determine what sort of nuclei can be produced uh, in environments like neutron star mergers. So that begs the question, where might the R process occur? For the longest time, um, the candidate site, and if you read many older textbooks, it was supernova. It was just a done deal, and supernova were the, um, were the site of the R process. There were no questions asked. But modern simulations since about the 1990s um, have shown that maybe it's only a rare class of supernova that uh, might achieve the conditions viable for a rapid neutron capture process. Um, so that's a current area of, um, of study. There's many great groups around the world in Europe, uh, in the United States and elsewhere that are, are trying to tackle this very difficult problem. And it's very difficult uh, for the, on the, on, on the computational side because it requires so much computing power. So people are looking into not only high performance computing with CPUs, but also high performance computing um, with uh, other um, hardware such as GPUs. Maybe there's a way that we can speed up the problem that way. The other uh, main candidate site that uh, which we'll focus our attention on here is, is compact object mergers. That's either the merger of neutron stars or a black hole uh, neutron star merger. And so you can see in this diagram, um, two neutron stars, for instance, may come together and then they tidally, uh, they, they ring around, they tidally fling out material, they create this accretion disk, and all of this material is then ejected. And so this, the study of the R process is really interesting because we want to take the trajectories that we get out of such simulations and we want to know uh, what uh, type of elements uh, can be produced. Can, they, can different elements be produced and the tidal ejecta versus the, the shocked ejecta or the accretion disk ejecta. And so let's turn our attention now to neutron stars specifically and try to see um, what's going on there. So I, I drew this cartoon of, um, of the merger of new, two neutron stars. And so you can see here, uh, neutron stars are quite small on the order of a, of a small city, but the the density of these objects are just immense. They're some of the densest objects in the universe. And they can potentially have very strong magnetic fields, much more than what we can produce uh, in the laboratory here on Earth. And typical masses, um, which gets into another aspect of nuclear physics with neutron star mergers, are roughly around 1.1 to 3 solar masses. The, the exact uh, dependency here uh, is very dependent on the equation of state. And so that's another area where nuclear physics really ties together with neutron stars. So what happens when these, uh, these uh, objects merge? Well, first you need, a, you need two neutron stars that are quite close to each other. Uh, as what happened with GW170817, um, and it's named for the date it was discovered. So we saw this event uh, in particular in this uh, nearby galaxy 44993, which is about 40 megaparsecs away. 
Uh, and there was just, uh, just a plethora of physics that came out of this interesting event. So the, the idea is that these neutron stars, they come together, they, um, they, they ring down and they merge. And this time scale takes a very long time, potentially uh, the coalescence time for the merger event could be something like a million years. And so this then ties not only our nuclear physics of you know, the equation of state and the nuclear synthesis, but it, to also to things like galactic chemical evolution, which is abbreviated GCE. So we need to know how these elements are created on potentially very long time scales on, in the duration of the universe so that we can understand whether or not mergers are the sole responsible uh, site for heavy element production, or is it a combination of supernova and mergers? Um, so, okay, so once these mergers, uh, once the, the neutron stars merge and they come together, as they come together, these gravitational waves are emitted. Uh, with GW170817, there was a, as a chirp mass of roughly 1.18 um, combined mass. And so that implied that it was a neutron star binary that merged. And so there were many, many um, discovery papers that happened uh, shortly after this event um, in August of 2017. And it really, really um, provided, again, a wealth of information. And so once the, the, the neutron stars merge together, that's when we're interested in the nucleosynthesis that can ensue. And this event and ones like it that we'll see in the future really open up just a, such a wide range of interesting questions, both on the nuclear physics side and the astrophysics side. So we wanna understand um, topics that will be discussed in our workshop are things like, was this event a typical event? How exactly did the uh, event produce uh, a remnant? Was it, was it a black hole that was left? Was it some neutron star that was left over? Um, how did uh, the equation of state uh, play a role um, in terms of did it, uh, you know, if we have a stiffer equation of state, how does that impact the um, very interesting aspects of neutron stars like the um, neutron star mergers like the tidal deformability. And then once this potential central object is created, how can neutrinos play a role, right? Because if something is dense and hot, it may be emitting neutrinos. Those may impact the nucleosynthesis that we obtain from such event. We also want to know about how much uh, material can be ejected because this then tells us about this galactic chemical evolution. Do we need uh, only neutron star mergers or do we need some supernova in order to describe um, the data that we see in stars, the heavy element uh, populations that we see in stars? And then finally, uh, you know, very close just after the event, um, there can be a very uh, interesting radioactive signal that comes, or an electromagnetic signal that comes from potentially from the radioactive decay of all of these elements that are synthesized. So remember in the R process, you synthesize the el these elements on the order of a second and then they radioactive decay um, back to the stable isotopes. And then so we wanna know, can, can there be any observable signals? And indeed, uh, GW170817 showed that yes, indeed there are observable signals and potentially uh, evidence of heavy element production was found. And so that begs the question with these types of events like mergers, what type of elements can be produced? Is it a whole range of elements? Is it only light elements? Is it heavy elements? Um, and really all of these questions here can be um, tied in some way to nuclear physics. Um, so now I wanna go over in our workshop some of the interesting aspects that researchers may be uh, talking about um, that are sort of on the cutting edge uh, of, of research here. So one of the aspects that I think is very fascinating that many researchers are working on is, is this idea of how do these heavy nuclei 
capture neutrons. And so here we can see um, some great work by uh, Stefan Guerrilli and colleagues that there's been some advances in, um, in, in a particular re reaction mechanism that's known as direct, direct capture. And um, oftentimes when we perform these nucleosynthesis calculations to get out what may be produced in a merger event, this component uh, is often missing. And so here we show that, uh, that uh, Stefan and colleagues show that this can be quite uh, impactful in terms of the cross-section that you can get out uh, for nuclei, especially far from stability, and those nuclei near closed shells. So if we're missing some component of captures, it may be that the capture rates, the neutron capture rates that we put in our simulations may be uncertain, um, potentially by orders of magnitude uh, for nuclei near the drip line or near closed shells. And so if there's a speed up in any way uh, for capture rates, it may be that this process occurs faster uh, and produces heavier elements than we, um, than we anticipate at the moment. So this is a very exciting area of research. And again, uh, Stefan and colleagues and others around the world are working on this type of cutting edge research that um, would be a, a topic of discussion at our workshop. Uh, another interesting open question is what sort of astrophysical conditions can arise in these merger simulations? So when the, the, when the merger comes together, what sort of trajectories are we looking at? Are they producing elements uh, that are only light? Are we producing heavy elements? What sort of um, distributions are we getting out? And there's great work being done by Jonah Miller and, and Francois um, uh, with these. I show both of their simulations here. Jonah Miller's is on the left. Um, and in both of these uh, simulations, they've done really interesting work with neutrino transport. The um, simulation on the left of, is an accretion disk where they used Monte Carlo neutrino transport, and they found that well, within the viewing angle of GW170817, we're indeed producing uh, quite a range of, of, of YEs, electron fractions here. And that means indeed we're producing potentially quite a range of nuclei from roughly first R process peak all the way to potentially second R process peak and maybe a little beyond that. Um, in other simulations, you can see, again, the YE distribution is quite large, and it's different in the polar region versus the whole total simulation. And that seems to be one of the interesting things that's coming out of modern simulations is that this distribution of elements may be much wider than what we have considered in the past. So that's quite fascinating and, and a topic um, that, of course, ties directly to nuclear physics. Um, in relation to the equation of state that they use in their simulations and also the neutrino physics that they use in their simulations. Uh, another open question that we uh, would like researchers to think about and address at a workshop is the nature of this electromagnetic signal that may arise uh, during the radioactive decay of neutron-rich nuclei. So when these nuclei are radioactive decay, they may emit um, this very bright signal. Uh, it's not as bright as a supernova. It's brighter, maybe roughly three orders of magnitude brighter than a nova. So that's why they call this idea this kilonova. And so there's, again, a very complex morphology that may develop at the end of these mergers. And so when we look at the signals uh, that come out of this, whether it be through a jet or through the radioactive decay of, of nuclei, we really need to know in very um, painstaking detail how not only uh, what the geometry is, but also uh, the composition is very important. So uh, one of the ideas that's been put forth by um, Brian Metzger, Dan Kaysen, and many others is that there may be this um, region which uh, has sort of a blue emission, which 
peaks on the time scale of days, followed by um, potentially an emission from uh, heavier nuclei that may be dominated by the lanthanides. And the lanthanides are very interesting for a number of nuclear physics reasons, but on the atomic physics area, they're, they're very interesting because of their very uh, high opacities there. And so that's where this red emission could potentially come from. And so you can see that this is a very complex open problem requiring not only atomic physics, but also nuclear physics. Let's see here. Um, so here's an example of um, one of the um, papers that came out in 2017. They, they looked at the, the light curve that came out in these different bands and um, they were able to uh, say in this paper uh, that they could match observation with a very low lanthanide um, mass fraction and relatively fast ejecta. However, other groups showed that maybe uh, there is a need for uh, some lanthanide production. And so this is a really fascinating point that composition is playing a very um, intricate role in the electromagnetic signal that may come from these events. Um, so that, beg that begs the question is not only can composition play an effect, but also maybe there's geometric effects that we haven't quite considered yet. And so one could imagine coming up with sort of uh, in a principal component analysis uh, sort of idea that there's different components to this merger ejecta. And the way this ejecta looks uh, relative to our viewing angle uh, uh, may give us some uh, further insights on, on exactly uh, what nuclei were produced. And indeed, how can the geometry impact light curves? So you can see that for something like a solar-like distribution, the geometry, these different cases that we showed just a moment ago, can indeed have a really strong impact on something like the volumetric luminosity. Um, whereas if we have composition um, that may be relatively neutron deficient um, in an actual simulation, uh, again, there, there can be quite a range of, of interesting um, uh, impacts from the geometry. And then, so that means that maybe, maybe there's an overlap with this space of you know, how much nuclei produce versus geometric effects. And I think we disentangle that via more observations and more uh, nice work like Oleg Korobkin is doing. So this is uh, quite interesting um, physics, simulation physics that couples together composition and electromagnetic signatures that could be discussed at our workshop. And then um, finally, on the last aspect of this uh, electromagnetic signal that uh, is really interesting to the nuclear physics community is what sort of predictions can we obtain with our current models? And so the way we do that is we look at um, different nuclear models and we run them through sort of the same astrophysical conditions. And then we see, ah, there's a range of different, not only compositions, but different heating rates that can ensue, ensue from these different models. And so that provides another area where nuclear physics is tying directly to potentially the observation in neutron star mergers. And so here you see the work by uh, Young Lin Zhu and colleagues uh, that there's roughly an order of magnitude difference between these models um, and potentially even more at late times, depending on the composition uh, that can be found in the nuclear heating um, from neutron star mergers. And so then the question is, well, that heating has to then be uh, thermalized and propagated through a transport uh, calculation to produce a light curve. And so uh, Jenny Barnes has looked at this type of work where you then look at the model variations that we can obtain from these uh, different types of radioactive decays. 
And what you see is that, yes, indeed, the heating, the nuclear heating does play a large role in what can come out uh, with the light curve modeling. So that's a really interesting aspect, um, hopefully an uncertainty that we can pin down uh, with future observations um, and future uh, work in this area. Another open question that researchers can address uh, in our workshop is sort of how far up in element number can we create? So when we remember when we were talking about the periodic table, can we get out to elements like agonesin at, at Z of 118? Do we get, do we even make things like actinides, et cetera? And so there's been great work on this front um, by a number of groups. Here I showcase um, Sam Giuliani's work. Uh, he's been looking at different nuclear models and he's trying to figure out here what sort of production, where does the R process, the nucleosynthesis actually end? And you can see in some models it ends around A of uh, 260, whereas other models may produce quite high. They may go beyond A of 300. Uh, so it's really fascinating uh, what these nuclear models um, may be telling us about the production of elements uh, in the in neutron star mergers. So this is a really a nice area of research um, that uh, many groups are working on. And yeah, I think all of the groups are in agreement essentially that you know this that, that we terminate the R process via some sort of fission recycling. So the nuclei get up here, they become so heavy that they they break apart and dump material back down in the lighter mass region. But exactly where they do that and how they do that by whether it's a neutron induced fission or beta delayed fission uh, is open uh, is an open question, and so that uh, merits um, some some more uh, research into this endeavor. So in that regard, one of the open questions is if we're producing things like actinides or super heavies, can we really find a smoking gun signature of the heaviest elements? Because if we do, then we know we have produced everything else. And we know definitively that we found the site of rapid neutron capture nucleosynthesis. So this is really, um, really an interesting avenue of research is if we do get up that heavy, can we find something that may be able to be measured or observed uh, with future events? With GW170817, there's still uncertainty involved um, and we never saw definitive production of elements like gold platinum, uh, uranium, anything uh, very, very heavy. There's hints of lanthanide production, but there's no definitive proof of something very heavy being created. And so one of the ideas, um, again, that Younglin and colleagues have come up with is that maybe if we look, not directly after the merger, but if you wait, maybe 50 on the time scale of 50 to 100 days, maybe you could see the production of something like a long lived um, fissioning species. And so uh, they've done calculations here where you can see, ah, the without the spontaneous of this particular uh, isotope of Californium, uh, my brightness would be down here, but with spontaneous fission, it would be several orders of magnitude higher. And so this would indeed be a smoking gun if we could have such an observation that uh, actinides were produced in a merger event. So this is a quite interesting uh, area where nuclear physics is really overlapping with the study of neutron star mergers. So you can use this idea of late time brightness as a proxy for actinide nucleosynthesis, really snazzy idea. Um, that begs the question though, if we're producing these heavy elements, we need to be able to calculate their yields. So then, uh, because those yields then get recycled back into the R process pattern at lighter mass numbers. So here's an example of a calculation that we did uh, where you have spontaneous fission of Californium 254 and here's its yield. That's how it places its material and breaks up into two lighter fragments. 
in the chart of nuclides. And so current studies, um, those, for instance, led by Nicole Vash, are looking at exactly this. We're, they're looking at how uh, fission yields can actually impact uh, the lighter element abundance that we observe in nature. And, and this figure shows that you can see uh, with uh, a more microscopic calculation of fission yields, we have this orange curve compared to some older calculations of just splitting the nuclei in two, equal, into two equal units. And so you can see right away that fission yields have a very potentially strong impact on the lighter element production, whereas heavier elements, those over here, remain somewhat insensitive to the choice of fission yields. And one can look at this another way by plotting abundances in terms of proton number rather than mass number. And you can see that indeed we get closer to some of these matches to halo stars with more robust uh, fission uh, calculations. And so why is this important? Well, it may, may mean that in neutron star mergers, the universality, this idea that elements are produced in the same ratios throughout a number of uh, a range of elements um, is actually goes down to lower mass number than we think. So normally we think of universality of the pattern. You can see the variation in these stars are quite small. We think of universality in the R process here, but maybe there's some consistency even down here. Um, that, that remains to be seen, uh, whether or not um, this idea uh, indeed comes to fruition that universality may extend down further. So this is another area where nuclear physics is directly uh, uh, impacting um, uh, the, the ongoing study of nuclear or neutron star mergers. So in another aspect of this, when it comes to fission studies is the work of uh, Marc Verrier. He is trying to improve uh, the calculation of fission yields using very uh, detailed models of how these nuclei break up. Here I show the charge yields of his nice calculations. And he was able to, for the first time, predict not only odd, even staggering scene in particle, uh, I mean in charge yields, but also uh, the charge polarization that uh, we also see experimentally um, when actinides uh, undergo uh, a fission event. And so this is from a new uh, technique that Mark has developed using particle number uh, projection technique. So again, you see that nuclear physics has a very strong overlap with uh, the nuclear, uh, the, the neutron star mergers. And one of the final things where uh, uh, we can study nuclear, nuclear physics in the context of neutron star mergers is this idea of galactic chemical evolution. In other words, how can we, if we know, you know certain elements were produced in a merger event and then we have many that are going off throughout the galaxy, what does the time evolution of such abundances look like um, uh, in the population of the interstellar medium? And so this can potentially answer questions such as whether or not all um, all we need are mergers to account for the R process or whether we need some amount of supernova, et cetera. And one of the studies that uh, Benoit and collaborators looked at is exactly this. If we take the LIGO-Virgo potential rate of neutron star mergers, um, just from GW170817, and we look at the potential production of an element like europium, which is a highly populated lanthanide, uh, can we obtain um, the potential um, production of europium um, as we look as a, as a function of time? And one of the things that this ties back to the nuclear physics is that maybe, uh, the current answer is maybe, but we need to really reduce the uncertainties in nuclear physics uh, in terms of the production of these nuclei before we can have such um, an answer to this question. And so that's yet another area where nuclear physics is really driving the study of neutron star mergers. 
So um, I will end uh, the discussion um, here. The, 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 the take home message is that nuclear physics is really intimately connected to the astrophysics and in particular with the study of nucleosynthesis and the rapid neutron capture process. Um, I think the, the study of the R process and neutron star mergers is just really fascinating because it ties together all of these intricate aspects of nuclear physics with all of the intricate aspects of astrophysics and atomic physics and observations. And so these ideas of studying nuclear properties and electromagnetic signals and astrophysical conditions all come together with the study of neutron star mergers. And these challenging open questions are being pursued by many, many research groups around the world. And they're all working together to sort of understand um, this, this difficult problem of the origin of the heavy elements. So I, I will end there and I, I will say that uh, we hope you join us for our workshop, uh, Probing Nuclear Physics with Neutron Star Mergers to be held in the summer of 2021. Thank you very much.